Hello, and welcome to Write Virtual Visits. Uh, we had a few minor technical difficulties getting our stream started, so we appreciate everyone's patience, but we are excited to welcome you to the June edition of Write Virtual Visits. Of course, this is our, uh, we're in our third year of doing these monthly events where we bring together two Frank Lloyd Wright designed public sites um, to kind of compare and contrast and showcase different elements of Wright's design uh, and the history of these sites. So we are really excited to have you all here watching the live stream on Facebook. Um, of course, we want your questions and comments. Uh, so please, anytime you think of a question or you have something to say, go ahead and drop it in the comments. We will be monitoring those and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end of the session uh, in just a little bit. Uh, I do want to give a special shout out to Forever Ready Productions. Without them, we would not be able to put on these great live streams every month. Uh, they do a lot of the hard work of making this possible. So we're really grateful for their support. So today, uh, since it's June and it's nice outside across most of the country, uh, we wanted to celebrate a couple of gardens at really remarkable right sites. And I was really excited to bring together the Allen House in Wichita, Kansas, with the Martin House in Buffalo, New York. They're both really superlative prairie period estates, really full works by Frank Lloyd Wright um, that have these notable parallels in the way that they're organized around these, these fantastic gardens. So we're going to be taking a look at that today. Um, and we will have as our guests, uh, Amy Reap, of the Allen House, the executive director there. And then of course, Mary Roberts, the executive director of the Martin House. So uh, we'll do brief introductions first. Uh, I'd like to ask Amy to come on and tell us a little bit about the Allen House. Hi, Amy. Hello. Um, well, welcome to the Frank Lloyd Wright Allen House in Wichita, Kansas. The Allen House was commissioned in 1916 and completed in 1918. The, this was the last of Wright's Prairie Houses. The home was designed for Henry and Elsie Allen, who owned the Beacon newspaper here in Wichita. Mr. Allen became governor of Kansas in 1923 and then later became senator in 1929. The Allen House is approximately 5,000 square feet, including the garden house and basement. The Allen House, we have restored back to the time frame of 1918 to 1923, and we have about 90% of our original furniture back in the home, along with many of the personal items that belong to the Allens. So when you visit the Allen House, you kind of feel like you just stepped in and the Allens have just stepped out momentarily. Um, the Allen House is an exceptional L-shaped prairie home with an enclosed courtyard and gardens that we will be exploring today. So now I'll turn it over to Mary at the Martin House. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Heidi and Anna and Eric. It's a pleasure to be part of today's Wright virtual visit. As mentioned, I'm Mary Roberts with Frank Lloyd Wright's Martin House in Buffalo, New York. We're pleased to be here. My introduction includes information about the Darwin Martin House as well, one of the significant examples of the intertwined design relationship between landscape and architecture. This may be the most comprehensive garden of any landscape right designed in any period of his life. As a residential garden, the Martin landscape has no apparent equal and it was planned and fully implemented by Wright as a unified composition of the architecture, the interiors, and the landscape. And Allison, if we could cue the first photo, you'll see the Martin House landscape plan. It includes formal aspects of English garden tradition and informal landscape elements more akin to Frederick Wall Olmsted's naturalistic approach to design. Perhaps a nod to the site's context in the historic Parkside neighborhood created by Olmsted in addition to the park and parkway system he designed for Buffalo, New York. Wright arranged architectural elements to frame the trees and the gardens beyond the walls and the windows. Interior spaces open fully to exterior views. 
artfully giving the landscape features a presence from within. And the gardens take on the character of outdoor rooms, framed and formed by the patterns of the building. Despite its, despite its importance, little remains of the original landscape from the early 1900s. A comprehensive rehabilitation was undertaken in 2018 and 19, based on research in our cultural landscape report. The research concluded that the historic property is also significant as a work of noted landscape architect, Walter Burley Griffin, who provided horticultural expertise as he was Wright's office superintendent during the design period. Our landscape rehabilitation work included the planting of about 8,000 plants, flowers, trees, and shrubs. The treatment recreated all the original individual components of Wright's design, maintaining the visual and spatial characteristics of the historic landscape. The majority of the plants used are original species, including specific cultivars. And there are still a few, few items on site that are original to the initial landscape planning, such as the Japanese wisteria, which covers the pergola. But perhaps the richest part of our landscape story is due to the Martins themselves. Both Darwin and Isabel Martin had an appetite for horticulture that pushed and prodded a design from right. They suggested alterations and they emphasized the importance of the plantings and their desire for an expansive garden. Martin even wrote once to Wright, we want a smaller house and a larger garden. Martins even hired Wright to design a home for their gardener, a lovely cottage that was built in 1908 adjacent to the historic site. And finally, once the landscape was fully established, it was managed by the Martins and their gardeners for more than three decades, during which time very little of substance changed. The landscape simply aged and matured in a way that living things could not escape. So I'm going to turn it back to Amy, please. And when we return, I'll talk a little bit more about the elements in this courtyard garden. Well, one of our main features of our enclosed courtyard is this wonderful bog pond. The pond is 20 by 40 feet and is only 18 inches deep at the west end by the piers. It is always filled with beautiful koi fish, lilies, and the tall reeds. We currently have 74 koi at the last count. It has always been designed to be a bog pond as the runoff from the yard and the guttering system drain through this pond. We have two cisterns, if you've been to visit the Allen House, that you see on the south side of the home that catch the rainwater from the gutters and fill the pond through a float system. There are also two drains on the patio level for the rainwater and the yard runoff that also drain directly into the pond that are still original and help keep the pond full. Also remember that when this house was built, homeowners didn't have the luxury of fire stations like we do today. So should a fire break out back in the day, this pond was also functional and could be used for a bucket brigade to extinguish any flames. The fountain you can see is original and still remains functional today with the original nozzle. We do heat the water during the winter and this keeps the water from freezing and cracking the plaster walls for preservation purposes Plus it keeps the fish in there year round so we don't have to take them out and house them somewhere else. On the other side of the brick piers is a ramp that goes to the basement of the garden house for the gardener's storage. The Allens did have a full-time gardener that worked on site as Mrs. Allen was heavily into garden and had cutting gardens. The Allen house was built on two city blocks and the one block south of the one city block on the south side of the home was nothing but a full cutting garden that she used. We will now go back to Mary at the Martin House to look at their courtyard garden in the gardener's cottage. Thank you, Amy. That was very interesting. It's easy here in our interior kitchen courtyard area to see the cross axial arrangement of the buildings. One of the areas where Wright created outdoor living spaces, or as he called them, garden rooms. The courtyard featured everything, including replica clothes poles, which had eyelets for detachable laundry lines, with a cap design that harmonizes with the wood detailing in the house. The pergola, our open air walkway through the gardens, connected the main Martin house with the conservatory. And growing up the sides of the pergola on metal frames, 
is Japanese wisteria, also known as Wisteria floribunda. It is a century-old plant imported by the Martins from Japan. Wisteria is a central theme at the Martin House, and representations of wisteria vines and blossoms are used in multiple art glass designs, as well as in the mosaic of our massive central fireplace. The wisteria, which now grows up the sides of the reconstructed pergola, is the original cultivar. It was grown from the few surviving historic plants that were removed from the site more than a decade ago. Those few remaining original wisteria vines were dug up and replanted in a nearby nursery to protect them while our site restoration work took place. And after being propagated to create sufficient quantities, the original plants were then brought back and replanted as part of our landscape rehabilitation. In order to protect the buildings, the plants are now trellised to keep them from interfering with or damaging the architecture. And Allison, if we could cue to the courtyard garden shot. The garden that's along the west side of the pergola is an English, an English flower border garden with many varieties of flowers, often used for cutting. Things such as blue delphiniums, white anemones, pink chrysanthemums. And the center courtyard beds contain beautiful peonies this time of year, and at certain points, lilies both popular garden and cutting flowers of the day. Our courtyard garden also has one of two fountain features on site, the other fountain being inside the conservatory. And then speaking of the conservatory, to the, oh yeah, Allison, if you can take the photo down now, thank you. To the rear of the estate, as I mentioned, the pergola leads into the conservatory. This was Wright's response to the client's request for a greenhouse. The conservatory was used to grow flowering vines, orchids, and other movable plants in containers that were placed throughout the house. The conservatory is a functioning building today filled with similar plants and with the operational mechanics of a greenhouse. The conservatory even features its own distinctive art glass pattern, but most were lost when the original structure was demolished. And on each of the four rooftop corners, Wright designed limestone birdhouses and in a bit of whimsy, he designated them Purple Martin Birdhouses for the Martin family. So I'm going to turn it back to Amy at this point in time, and I'll see you in a few minutes. We are now standing in front of our garden house. The garden house was one of the main changes that Elsie received when she saw the original plans to the Allen House. This was the original location for the garage. When Mrs. Allen asked for larger bedrooms on the second floor, the garage was attached to the home. In order to enclose the courtyard, Wright added this garden house for Elsie to use. It is a two-story garden house. The upper floor was for her entertainment, for social events and family time, and the lower floor was for the gardener's storage. It was just originally screened in, and after seven years of use, Elsie had right add windows so she could use it year-round. Allison, if we could look at the historical photo. You can see the construction photo from 1917 when the garden house was being built. And then if we could show the current photo of what the garden house looks like today. Wright sets this garden house up three steps so you get a completely different perspective when you look back at the home. And then you have to descend down six steps on the other side to get to the pond level. When you step up another two steps to get inside the garden house, you do get a completely different perspective of the gardens in the home. I do have to say this is probably my favorite spot on the property. And if you could get internet inside that garden house, that's probably where our offices would be. The perspective from inside that garden house is just wonderful. Uh, once, it, once you're inside the garden house, the same finishes are used on the interior with the wood banding, the scrumbling, and the bookshelves. If you could show the interior shot, they can see that. Um, however, the garden house does not have the gilding on the mortar joints like we do on the interior of the, of the home. We don't have the gilding. We use the garden house today to show pieces of Wright's designs in the study collection. It's a wonderful space though. And then the basement, like I said before, was for the gardener storage. And we also house the um, pool equipment down in the basement. And it also has been completely restored back to the way it was. 
And now we'll just switch back to Mary. Hello again. We're now on the veranda of the Martin House. And I have to apologize. It's a garbage pickup day in the Parkside neighborhood, so there's a truck behind us that's moving momentarily. But what I wanted to talk about here on the, me, on the veranda is the flora cycle, which is a distinct enhanced circle of vegetation that provides sequential blooming and colors from March through November. It also provides a natural screen between the home and the surrounding streetscape, and it's the most striking element of the landscape design. Plantings in the forest side area include forsythia, spirea, rose of Sharon, spindle trees, euonymus, or burning bush trees, as well as seasonal perennials and thousands of bulbs. Overall, there were about 20,000 items originally planted on the estate, and now there were about 8,000. While the original planting plan was designed to plant thick and thin quick, we took a less wasteful approach to the current re rehabilitation. Our plan reduced the number of plants while maintaining the same visual and spatial results in the mature landscape. Of the 8,000 plant items on site, about 7,000 of them are flowering bulbs, the majority in the florist cycle. And if we could cue Allison to the photo for this segment too, the plans for the florist cycle came out of Wright's office in a request to replace the original design for a hemicycle that had already been planted a year earlier, and it added more flowers in line with Isabel's desire. Wright's floor was a detailed plan arranged its around and park, repeating the pattern of plants and colors throughout. There are seven and a half sections in the repeating pattern, and the sunken interior setting of the floor cycle is another wonderful example of Wright's outdoor rooms. And if we want to cue back to the estate, we're going to look at the East Lawn, which stretches northward towards the secondary residence, the Barton House. The Barton House had its own landscape plan as well. The lawn area has a raised section with additional garden beds on the east side of the pergola. And somewhat of an anomaly, a Richard Bach sculpture was placed on a terrace wall representing a sculptural depiction of spring. This was originally intended to be part of a triptych design that was never realized in its entirety. But there are lovely photos of the Martin's daughter, Dorothy, on her wedding day in 1923, standing alongside that sculpture. Her wedding and the celebratory reception both took place in the gardens amidst the Martin's landscape that was so loved by the entire family. Throughout their lives, both Darwin and Isabel Martin often worked in the landscape. After retiring from the Larkin Company in 1925, and in later years, even after suffering strokes and an inability to speak, Darwin's most optimistic diary entries related to his gardening efforts. As Frank Lloyd Wright famously once said, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. So we invite you to visit the Martin House in person and study the natural environment which Wright created and which we lovingly maintain and interpret for visitors all year long. So back to the uh, hosts, I believe, at this point in time. So back to the terrace, the overall garden was used as an outdoor living room and the Allens entertained with rugs and furniture out here on the terrace. If you could, Allison, cue up the historical photo and it shows we're looking at the same angle here on the terrace. You can see the historical photo. Um, you can't quite see it in the photo, but we still have the ball planters on the wall. And they would entertain here on the courtyard as an extension of the living room. We have all these ball planters. They are original. Our aggregate here, though, is more of a brown tone. And Wright wanted the planters to match the Carthage marble that they were sitting on. So he had oyster shells ground up and mixed in so they would match the gray color. So if you're here and you come for a tour, be sure to look closely and you can see some of the shells mixed in with the aggregate. For our gardens, we have a dedicated group of garden stewards. They come every Monday and they tend to these beautiful gardens. They have done extensive, extensive research and they've put back in native plants into these gardens, hundreds of different varieties of plants, um, vertical plants to con contrast with the horizontal lines of the house. 
We just had a garden tour this past weekend and we welcomed over 1,200 guests through this garden over three days. People didn't want to leave. The gardens are just so organic and peaceful that we almost had to push them out every day at five o'clock. Everybody, just the sound of the water and the beautiful plantings. Um, there's something really is just very serene about Frank Lloyd Wright's long horizontal beds, the vertical plants. It really is a beautiful space to be in. Uh, we do know that Frank Lloyd Wright and his students stopped here on their way to Taliesin and spent the night on the terrace. Frank Lloyd Wright stayed in the guest room. The students slept on the terrace. But how serene that must have been to sleep out here in these beautiful gardens and listen to the water. We do have one special hydrangea plant left in the garden that Elsie planted. We are very protective of this plant, um, but we have taken cuttings and transplanted them around the property. Um, so that is very special to us. And uh, over in the corner, we do have the Frank Lloyd Wright hostas planted. You can see those back in the corner. Those are Frank Lloyd Wright hostas and they love where they are at. They are performing very nicely this year. So that concludes our garden tour. We do hope you will visit the Allen House and enjoy our gardens and our home as much as we do. So we will turn it back over to Eric for any questions you might have for us or Mary at the Martin House. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Amy and Mary. It's really a treat to get to visit these special gardens today. Um, and, uh, you know, I've I've been lucky enough to visit the Martin House in person. I've not yet been to the Allen House, but I think, you know, as I remarked at the beginning, I'm, I'm so struck, and I think some other people have been in the comments as well, about some of the similarities and parallels of these two estates, even though they were built a decade apart from each other. Um, I think uh, it's, it's so great to see them both side by side in, in this way. Um, so one of the questions that I wanted to ask, and I, I remind everybody who's who's watching, by the way, go ahead and put your questions in the comments. And we have some time uh, now, a few minutes to ask some questions. But I want to start with uh, building on something that Amy said. Uh, so Amy, at the Allen House, you, you mentioned that you've got a group of garden stewards that come and help you maintain the gardens. Can you say a little bit more about that group? Are they volunteers? Are they doing that? Um, that's that's amazing. Yes, they are all volunteers. And there's a group of 12 and they come every Monday and they're here four to five hours every single Monday. And they come year round with the exception of January. They might not come every Monday. But other than that, they're here every Monday. And Mary, I know that the Martin House has made a huge investment in the restoration or the reconstruction of the flora cycle. What does it take to maintain all of the gardens there uh, every year? Well, it takes a village. Uh, much like Amy said, we have a dedicated crew of about 20 landscape volunteers that come Mondays, uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and now on Saturdays to maintain it. Uh, our Eight, our estate is about a one and a half acre estate. And with this many plantings and garden beds, not only do we have volunteers, but we have a professional landscape team that does the heavy lifting, like the mulching in the spring. And we of course have a director of facilities that maintains all the functional aspects of, you know, how does the lawns get, how do the lawns get cut? But we also rely on our contemporary landscape architect for that big picture guidance so that we can maintain rights um, design for the landscape so that as it matures, it becomes what he intended it to be. But it's very labor intensive. So I, at, at the beginning of our tour, um, Amy, I was really struck by the practical considerations that went into the creation of the bog pond. The fact that it serves as sort of a stormwater management feature and a firefighting feature. Um, Mary, I'm really curious, are there or were there historically um, things that Wright did on the Martin estate to manage stormwater, or is that less of a concern there? There was less of a concern for stormwater, but you make me think of one thing that he did, which was a unique uh, contemporary design, was there are 24 floral urns that are located throughout the estate on the tops of the walls at punctuations of the axes, in particular in the end of the veranda. 
and they were all irrigated, mechanically irrigated from the very beginning. And, you know, we don't have a bog pond, but I love the idea. And there was one drawing that there was a suggestion at one point in time, and it never was realized that they might put a pool alongside the pergola. So sometimes I think, well, oh, wouldn't we love to have that large water feature? But for now, we're very content with our two courtyard gardens or our fountain in the courtyard garden, as well as in the conservatory. And I do want to say we were the ones having the um, connectivity issues today. So I apologize that we didn't walk through the gardens as much as we had hoped to. But um, thank you for being here. Well, I, I'll ask one more question um, before we start to close out. But uh, do, do you hold events in the garden generally? Do you have your own events? Do you rent them out for events? Um, can I go first? Sure. Yes, we use our gardens extensively. Um, just in the last week, we had a 450 person slow roll bike event where they bike through the neighborhood looking at historical uh, buildings. And then they came back here and were in the gardens and on the lawn with music and festivities. We had a, another event last night where we had about 100 people in the community that were walking around the gardens. We very proudly participate in the largest garden walk in the country it takes place in Buffalo in July on a certain weekend. I think it's July 23rd and 24th this year. And we also participate in Open Gardens Buffalo every Thursday evening in July. So yeah, we've done concerts on the East Lawn with the music on the raised terrace. We call them Music and Bloom. We offer home and garden tours now so that people can get a little bit more information about the landscape itself. Whatever we can do, we all love to be out here. We, you know, this time of year, it's spectacular. What about you, Amy? Yeah, we do, we do our own events um, as much as we can in the gardens. And our, our biggest one is probably we do a tea on the terrace, um, which is always a sellout event. Um, and we do that in May every year, on, usually on Mother's Day weekend. Um, we don't do rentals, um, but we do a lot of our own events and highlight the gardens. Great. Well, as we wrap up, um, I, I always like to ask, you know, the, the purpose of right virtual visits is to showcase public sites and hopefully whet people's appetites to visit them in person. Um, so can each of you just briefly talk about, um, you know, to what extent you're open and, and having tours and where people can go to learn more? And I'll, I'll call on Mary first. Sure. We are open seven days a week this time of year. We have a whole array of tours. Everything is visible on our website. Beyond our basic tours and extended plus tours, we do specialty tours based on the seasons and what's going on. Um, and we do summer camps and evening programs. We're having a wonderful fundraiser at the end of the summer on September 1st. We call it a garden party, El Fresco dining, live music and the like in the landscape. So everything is on our website. That's the best place to get the most current information on how to make reservations. Yeah, and we are open for tours um, Wednesday through Saturday, and everything's available on our website, flrightwichita.org, and you can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All right. Well, thank you both so much, Amy and Mary. This was really a treat. Um, and thanks to everyone who tuned in to watch live. Of course, the recording will be available up on our Facebook uh, page, as well as on the Conservancy's webpage for Right Virtual Visits, which you can always find at saveright.org slash WVV. Um, Please mark your calendars for our next uh, edition of Right Virtual Visits, which will be on Thursday, July 14th. Um, as has become customary in July, we'll actually be focusing on uh, celebrating the World Heritage listing of Right Sites. Um, so we'll be talking more about an aspect of that, and we hope that you'll all plan to join us for that. Um, so. With that, I think uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Mary. Thank you to our producers at Forever Ready. And uh, we will sign off for this month. Thank you so much. <laughs>